I'd like to let everyone know that this is the last podcast until after the first of the year. I'm going to take a little break during the holidays, but I'll be back in January with some brand new episodes. In the meantime, there are 26 episodes available, so you might dig in and maybe find an episode that you missed. It's been a wonderful first year, and I'd like to thank each of you who listen to the show for the continued support. I'd like to start today's show with a poem that was written by Bruce Kiskadden. It's entitled, The Medicine Show. Mind them medicine shows, how they drifted around, in tents and in wagons and making the towns. You bet the old medicine doctor was there, big hat and frock coat and a heap of long hair. His big phony diamonds as big as small rocks and the light checkered pants and the way he could talk. He had medicine fetched there from every land, from the tropical isles to the African sand, from Asia and Europe and some from Japan. He could cure anything that was wrong with a man. He had pills and elixirs for taking inside and liniment too for to rub on the hide. And for curing old age, he had something for that. It came plumb from Calcutty, the real tiger fat. He would charm snakes and lizards and do some card tricks that sure was amazing to all of us hicks. We allowed it draw poker, he'd sure win a stack. He could turn any card that you'd name in the pack. And them words that he said when he made his big speech, they was plumb highfalutin, well nigh out of reach. Then he had them two minstrels that he carried along, and between every act was a dance and a song. And let me remark, there was one certain thing. Them fellers could dance and them fellers could sing. They could play on the banjos and crack lots of wit, and wherever they went, they sure made a big hit. They put on some good shows in the free open air, on a stage of rough boards by a gasoline flare. They was pretty smart jaspers, if you want to know. Them fellers that run the old medicine show. Now the Orchestries all has some fellers that croons, using worked-over hoedowns and plantation tunes, and they wonder us old boys don't laugh at the jokes that is sprung on the stage by the theater folks. Why, it's mostly old stuff that we heard long ago, out in front of a tent at a medicine show. Now the medicine man's a thing of the past, and hosses and wagons is leaving us fast. And the minstrel performers and all of that like is doing their stuff for the radio mic. But I'd sure like to saddle a pony and go into some little town to a medicine show. Howdy folks, this is Andy Hedges, and you're listening to Cowboy Crossroads. On each episode, I interview a different guest and ask them to share stories and discuss music, poetry, and culture from the working Cowboy West and beyond. My guest today is Pip Gillette. If you haven't already, I'd recommend going back to the last episode and listening to the first part of my interview with Pip. On this second part of our conversation, Pip talks about the roots, influences, and origins of traditional cowboy music. Here's Pip Gillette. Once we got into the music and the cowboy music, and we were, of course, doing the things we'd learned off of the uh, so many of the records that we'd grown up listening to, uh, and then started, you know, you're constant. We were always trying to do songs that everybody else wasn't doing. We were always trying to find obscure tunes we thought that, you know, needed to be brought back and kept alive and uh, were hard to hear. And uh, so we were always digging and, you know, clawing and trying to find these tunes. And uh, also, it you know, finally occurred to us that, I mean, you start, again, if you start thinking about the inspiration for things and where that came from and where did that come from, 
and uh, it takes you back. Well, I mean, of course, you know, we went back to the, uh, uh, well, I uh, bought a recording, actually, in Prescott, Arizona, at the gathering out there in Prescott one year, which was the Minstrel Banjo. It was re- released by uh, Rounder Records, and it was about six or seven, I forget how many different banjo players that were all interested in performing music of the minstrel area, like the 1840s. And, uh, of course, the minstrel banjo, the banjo, of course, African instrument brought to this country, were played on plantations by slaves, and uh, and the bones, of course, was a, a big part of that. Uh, you know, they talked to slave narratives, talk about the bones and the banjo being the music for a Saturday night dance, you know. And uh, so uh, I heard this recording, and, uh, and it was just amazing. It was just, uh, it was such a... A revelation that because uh, of course these banjos uh, were playing with gut strings and if they weren't gut strings they were nylon strings that are sort of simulated gut string at such a completely different sound of the banjo that you've ever heard in your life if you've just heard Earl Scruggs and, and bluegrass style banjo this is like a different totally different animal you know this is a different thing entirely and uh it's not a question of one's better than the other. It's just a question of that's what was the sound of that era and the period. And so that got me going on the banjo again. I'd been messing around with the banjo since the late 60s, but very limited. Um, and had no, you know, I mean, my inspiration was Pete Seeger. And, uh, you know, I didn't uh, have any clue as to this period of music, which, like I said, was a... A real major moment. I just love that stuff. Uh, um, one of the great banjo players of on that CD is a fellow named Joe Ayers, A Y E R S, I believe is how he spells his last name, from Virginia. Who all of these guys seemingly agree is like the guy. Like if you're gonna, if you want to hear the banjo played in 1843, listen to Joe Ayers, because he is like the guy. I mean, he does it like it was, you know. A lot of the, you know, a lot of the guys sort of, it's stylistically there, but he apparently, (laughs) it's like you're there, you know. Anyway, it was fascinating. Um, So that got us interested uh, in the minstrel music. And of course, again, going back, you realize you're thinking, okay, the war between the states has ended. The, the trail driving era is beginning. We're driving cattle now from Texas to Wichita, Kansas, and Abilene, Kansas. We're doing the trail drive. Well, what's going on? Well, the music, the pop music, is minstrel music. Stephen Foster, uh, Dan Emmett, uh, all these songs. These are the songs, these are the pop songs. These are the songs that if you know a pop song, you know Old Dan Tucker, and you know Beautiful Dreamer, and all these songs, and uh, Camp Town Races, and uh, so we're going, okay, you know, so minstrel music is the pop music, and of course it's only the pop music in the in a live setting, because there's that's the only way you're going to hear any music, is live. So, and of course, Jack Thorpe, Don Edwards said, you guys have, need to read the book uh, Partner of the Wind. And of course, the first chapter of that is partner of uh, is banjo in the cow camp, at the title of that. And he talks about the black Texas cowboys sitting around a chuck wagon playing the banjo and singing songs about women, the cotton patch, and, and cutting horses. And he says that was his great epiphany, you know, great moment of like I got I got to start saving these songs and writing them down. So uh, you know, we're we're thinking, okay, so you got minstrel music. And he talks about that, too, in his book, of course. He talks about all these different influences. Then you talk about the Irish guys. You talk about the Mexican guys. And you talk about all these guys coming together at this very unique moment in American history. Um, You know, for example, obviously the African-American guys were, you know, six months ago were somebody's property. Well, now they're free 
human beings. And you come out here and you're all going west. Everybody's going west to, to, to escape the depression of the South, the, the, the terrible, you know, devastation after the war. Uh, and, and people, are, of course, coming from Europe. You got Irish guys and Scottish guys, and you got North. Everybody's heading west because that's where the land is, and that's where this new world is that we're about to steal from the Indians, you know. And uh, so. Um, it's an interesting moment, and that's the thing that is very sad to me about cowboy music is that you say, I do cowboy music, and people say, oh, yeah, right, like Gene Autry, Roy Rogers, Sons of the you know, Pioneers. Nothing against those guys, but it has nothing to do with what was happening in 1870. It has to do with what was making children's films in the 1940s based on pop music of the 1940s with Western lyrics has nothing to do with the actual events. And, uh, you know, it should be a major part and considered, in my opinion, a major part of all roots music, of American roots music. It's a great moment because, again, you have these guys that were former slaves. You've got guys straight off the boat from Ireland and Scotland, and you've got all these Mexican cowboys. You've got this incredible melting pot of cultures, and they're working together in a way they'd never worked before because these guys now are suddenly based on their skills and their abilities, and your life depends on the other guy. You know, uh, that changes people's attitudes often. When you know your life is in the hands of that guy, and you know that guy is about as good as it gets, and you trust in him, and, and, and you're, you know, suddenly you don't really care where he grew up, what his background is, what his color of his skin is, what anything else is. You just know he's really good at what he does. And that's the guy I will ride the river with, as they say, you know. He's the guy that uh, I think is damn good at what he does. And I, I admire him and I really enjoy working with him. And sitting around a campfire and you listen to the songs and you're suddenly listening to songs and music that you'd never heard because you never hung around a plantation before, you know. You didn't sit in the slave quarters, you know. So suddenly all these, these various cultures are coming together in a very real moment and uh, blending. And uh, I think it's a fascinatingly exciting, great American moment. It's the same thing that makes American music what it is, you know, the blending of all these different cultures, the blending of, of uh, the world. That's what, of course, is so exciting about America when it's doing its best job of being itself and what it was meant to be. And uh, and I think there's nothing, uh, there's just no better moment in, in, as far as I can, I can think of as a, a American music, in other words, it, it sort of almost begins with the trail drive era, you know, because that's when slaves were no longer slaves. That ends that. So you've got people mixing in a different way uh, and blending cultures, and I think that's fascinating and exciting and uh, and tragically sad that it's not considered uh, what it is uh, because of the fact that so many people think of the 1940s and 30s T movies and the TV shows and things that are totally inaccurate and, and not based on anything except fantasy. And uh, they don't understand, uh, you know, and I think it would help everybody. We've played in schools. A guy and I go in and play for classrooms, you know, and you go in and, and the teacher says, okay, the Gillette Brothers are going to play cowboy music and you have a bunch of African-American kids that sort of yawn and kind of go... Oh, brother, it's like, this is going to be stupid. And, you know, and you're going, you don't understand that you are as much a part of this as anybody else. And, but they don't know that because it's been ignored historically. It's just not there. So most people don't realize there were a tremendous number of black cowboys, Mexican cowboys, and this whole cross-cultural deal because it's not in the movies and it's not on the TV shows for the most part. You know, very few exceptions. You can probably count them on maybe not even need one hand. So that's where we kept going back. And, and then again, that's one of the great things about cowboy music uh, to me. And I've said before that all my favorite musics are in it. 
you know, if you like the blues, if you like country blues, and if you like Irish music, and if you like Scottish music, and if you like, uh, you know, some great, uh, the great minstrel kind of, you know, uh, Tin Pan Alley kind of, you know, uh, uh, emotional sort of romantic kind of songs. Uh, again, uh, you know, Stephen Foster. I mean, you know, I Dream of Jeannie with the Light Brown Hair. Uh, and the, the songs of the era of the war between the states. You know, uh, Lorena, uh, there's so, so many beautiful songs, wonderful songs. And uh, uh, All Quiet Along the Potomac Tonight. Have you, are you familiar with that song? Amazing song. All quiet along the Potomac tonight, except here and there a stray picket is shot as he walks on his beat to and fro by a rifleman hid in the thicket. And the, but the line is, not an officer shot, only one of the men. And it's not going to make the news. So it's all quiet along the Potomac tonight, in spite of the fact that there's guys getting killed. You know, but it's not a big deal, you know. And this was written during the war. And uh, it's just so much like what we continue, sadly, to do. But these songs are all there. And people were, these emotions and these great songs are, are there. So uh, it's such a rich, rich moment and period, I think. And uh, sadly, kind of ignored, just left out, you know. It doesn't exist. And cowboy music is relegated to... Kids Saturday matinees. Yeah. Nelly Bell. Well again, we were thinking what what existed? Eighteen seventy, what are we talking about? Just ignore Everything that came afterwards, for the most part. I mean, certainly after the 20th century. Uh, so what what would what was there, you know? And of course, what was there was uh, homespun music. Of course, there was people that you know. If you grew up as a kid, you know, you heard your parents sing a song, and if they were from Ireland, and if their parents were from Ireland, they might be singing, you know, uh, an Irish song. Needless to say, well. The lyrics changed, obviously, because people kept rewriting these melodies. So you had that going on. And then you had the pop music, which was the minstrel shows. And that was the more formalized thing in music halls and sheet music and for piano players. And, of course, a lot of people played instruments because that's the only way you had music. Uh, and then you had the medicine shows, and they would come to town. And and that was a great moment for rural, rural communities. You know, you had these guys coming with a whole show of free entertainment, of music and dance and comedy and, and all this stuff. And then, of course, like TV, you know, or the radio, they give you the pitch, you know. They got something to sell, but they want to get a crowd first. You know, they need a bunch of people there. And so you had all all this uh, banjo players and, and of course, coming out of the same minstrel era thing and coming out of uh, what started on the plantations, of course. Bones players and the banjo and fiddles and, and, and these songs. And uh, it was a, you know, interesting thing that has, of course, again, the minstrel stuff gets... Uh, complicated with uh, racial deals and blackface minstrelsy, you know, uh, is obviously problematic, uh, difficult to deal with uh, in a lot of ways. But I actually tend to think that the early, the early 1840s and, and, and you know, for the next maybe 20, 30 years uh, of black minstrelsy actually, uh, certainly pre uh, uh, pre-war between the states um, was, you know, they say that uh, imitation is the strongest form of flattery, is imitation. And I honestly believe that those guys, those early banjo players and those early musicians, they were not amused or thought this was funny. They thought it was great. And, uh, you know, a lot of them were Irish. And, of course, the Irish uh, had a lot of some of the same problems that the African Americans had. Irish need not apply, you know, was a sign that would be up in front of businesses and stuff. So you had they had their difficulties, not the same, and maybe not obviously to the extent. 
But uh, a lot of them were uh, some of the minstrel musicians, uh, you know, the, the Irish descent. Anyway, I'd like to think that a lot of them were, uh, it was uh, flattery, really, that they were trying to emulate these guys and the fact that uh, a lot of the early stuff, a lot of the early minstrel stuff was kind of political and that somehow by going blackface, they could be free to make some of these political points that they didn't feel comfortable doing as themselves. They could make statements that were you know, it would have been more generally accepted in, in a sort of a, I don't know, you could sort of get away with it, perhaps. Uh, later, of course, you know, the really ugly period of uh, of the, the blackface kind of period, like the 1890s when they started the uh, coon songs, you know, there came a really ugly, ugly racist period with, with, with these coon songs. And... Uh, caricatures and and really really racist really uh ugly uh period that i think the early minstrel guys were not a part of at all i mean the songs don't even they don't reflect that even the early stuff you know the later stuff and of course once again of course you had black musicians african-american musicians writing some of the stuff themselves because if you're going to write and you you have to Right, what people want, you know. So there was uh, there was all this this sort of stuff going on. But anyway, oh, back to the medicine shows. Yeah, well, I mean, again, the medicine shows were a great form of entertainment, and we thought that uh, guy gave me. I was always interested in the bowron, the Irish drum, and uh, he gave me a video, an instructional video. I'd found a bowron somewhere, and uh, didn't know how to play it. He found an instructional video. So he, I learned how to play the drum from that, and oh, there was a special little section on playing the bones, too. And that got Guy's attention. And so he went out and found some cow rib bones, a deceased bovine on the place, and uh, cut them to the size. And, and uh, his very first set of bones turned out to be his favorite set of bones that I'm still playing that were like the best set of bones. It was just miraculous because they're not all the same at all. They're all very, you know, thickness and everything. So it would sound like you would just go out and get some rib bones, but it's not as easy as that, you know. Anyway, he got interested in playing the uh, bones and uh, that, again, kind of... Uh, and I was, you know, minstrel banjo, and so we're totally into this, you know, 1800s, mid-1800s kind of sound. And uh, we thought that that was what the, these guys were hearing. This is what they would have done. And my, my, my mother, for example, when she was a girl in the 20s, eight, uh, 1920s, her grandfather, who was of uh, Irish descent, uh, uh, Jonathan Jenkins Porter, he one day sat her on his knee and sang to her Old Dan Tucker. And he, it was the only time he ever sang anything to her, and he sang Old Dan Tucker's and got run riding the town, riding the goat, leading the hound, hound did bark and the goat did jump, and Old Dan Tucker went bump on a stump. She sang that to us then as a kid. So we literally, that's one of those classic folk, you know, stories are handed down from grandfather to, to mother to, to, to kids. So we'd always heard Old Dan Tucker, which, of course, is a, a Dan Emmett song. And it was written, actually, I think it was 10 years before my grandfather was even born. I think it was like 41. I'm not sure of the dates exactly. But I once when I told these stories more often, I had it sort of clearer in my mind. But you stop telling them and you start to forget it. But it was written 10 years before he was even born, and he knew the song, you know. And then Guy and I started to do Old Dan Tucker all over the place, and people would come up to us afterwards and go, you know, I haven't heard that song since my grandfather used to sing that song, and I remember that, and, and I'll be darned, and that brought it all back. And, and that, of course, is Dan Emmett, and it's a minstrel song. Well, it was a pop song of the day. Everybody knew these songs. I mean, you know, if you were interested in stuff and those were some of the songs you knew so yeah we thought that's cool as heck you know we said that's 
you know, so, so we started, that just got us going. And, uh, and the medicine show thing, of course, uh, a friend of ours from Nacogdoches, Texas, uh, Steve Hartz, had a medicine show that he had put together, a whole theater evening. And he wrote that wonderful spiel, the, the pitch, you know, that we then asked if we could do and uh, we put a little tune to it that we did and, and then added the whole pitch, you know. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the point in the evening where it's, you know, time to, I can't even think of it now. <laughs> but anyway, the whole medicine show thing, we realized that was, a, was a, again, medicine show, minstrel, those were where you're going to hear professional musicians. Other than that, you're going to hear people playing in their parlors if you were lucky enough to be in someone's parlor, or you're going to hear it on someone's porch or in a bunkhouse or a chuck wagon fire. But that's it. That's pretty much where you're going to hear it. Jack Thorpe was the very first person to collect cowboy songs. And his stories of his collecting trips and his book, Partner of the Wind, are a great source of inspiration and information to all of us who play traditional cowboy music. Here's a quote from Jack Thorpe. A lot of singing on the range had nothing to do with cowboy songs as such. In different camps, I encountered railroad, mountain, river, and granger songs, as well as sticky sweet sentimental ballads like Molly Lou, Sweet Molly Mine, and my little Georgia May. Cowboys weren't always singing about little doggies or give me a home where the buffalo roam. Of course, Jack Thorpe carried a banjo, and it was a piccolo banjo, which he describes as a mandolin banjo. And I, for, for years, of course, thought that that really meant a mandolin banjo, which, of course, is a mandolin with a banjo body. Well, it turns out uh, that the piccolo banjo, which is a tiny banjo, it's, it's I think it might even be smaller than the ukulele banjo, um, but it's a five-string banjo, and it was invented by uh, S.S. Stewart, which was a Pennsylvania, Philadelphia banjo maker uh, late 1800s and he was a great proponent of banjo orchestras so he had all these different size banjos like if you say a banjo orchestra today usually that means like 50 guys with 10 or banjos well in his day he came up with all these different size banjos so he had cello banjos with great big pots he had piccolo banjos with tiny pots he had the banjarine uh, and he had, uh, you know, all these different size banjos that were supposed to be the different voices of the different instruments of an orchestra. And uh, he was a great proponent of that. Well, Thorpe carried around this little piccolo banjo, which in the S.S. Stewart catalog, they describe as a mandolin banjo sound. So I think that's where the confusion lay in that Suddenly, it wasn't that it was a mandolin banjo. It was simply that it was described as a mandolin sort of sounding uh, instrument, you know, I don't, in, the, in its range. Because that's what uh, I've heard, that he actually played this piccolo, which, is, which also makes sense because it's a tiny little five-string banjo, which you could throw in a saddlebag and in the back of your horse and you could carry around with you. You can't carry anything else with you. I mean, it's, you know, the smallest five-string banjo there is. So he was supposedly, yeah, he talks about walking out of a cafe in Waco with his, uh, carrying it with him, I guess, you know, I don't know, over his shoulder or something. And this guy comes running up to him and says, we got a medicine show down the block here and our banjo player is drunk. Can you play that thing? And he says, yeah. He says, well, why don't you come down here and help us out? So he went down and played with the this medicine show. And they offered him a permanent position, and he declined. He said, no, I, I won't, guess I won't do that right now, but uh, thanks anyway. But so, yeah, that he mentions the, the, there you go. You got the medicine show in there. He talks about these Irish horse traders and their music, and he talks about these, you know, of course, the very first thing is the African-American Texas Cowboys playing banjo around the chuck wagon fire. And he mentions uh, Stephen Foster hearing the uh the minstrel music coming out of, you know, saloons in Fort Worth, walking down the street, you'd hear this 
music and piano players coming out, and that's what they'd be playing. So he mentions all the things that we did on the uh, uh, Cowboys, Mitchells, and Medicine shows, and we thought that would be a fun deal, and, and we quote him, we quoted Thorpe, uh, you know, specifically these different sort of moments that he experienced, and we thought, well, that makes real good sense, and that's what you would have heard. You know, and that was fascinating to us. And we thought, you know, this is very, very cool. And that's the period that we've been, you know, everything cowboy kind of goes back to the trail driving days as the sort of great moment, you know. Uh, So that's what was happening, you know, and we got it from the horse's mouth, as it were. But it was interesting because we had not read the book, and yet we'd kind of thought it, sort of through ourselves, just thinking what was available. What could have what could you have heard? And then it was confirmed by Thorpe. It was really cool because it was like, oh wow, you know, he's he's going, yeah, you were actually right. <laughs> so yeah, we uh Jack Thorpe, of course, uh not Jack Thorpe, Teddy Blue Abbott um talks about some of the uh tunes that he apparently you know his foreman used to say that he was worth his wages just for his entertainment value you know not even you know, nothing to do with his cowboy work at all he just said he's worth paying just because he keeps the crew spirits up and everything and he's so funny and entertaining to be around so uh anyway he mentions this as being one of the songs that he was his favorite tune that when he went up the trail uh, i don't know which year it was but he said he sang it all the way from Texas to Miles City, Montana. And when he got to Miles City, he got everybody singing it there. And uh, it was uh, the little black bull come down the mountain. Good to visit with you. All right, folks, that's it for today's episode. I'd like to thank Pip Gillette for taking the time to visit with me. You can find out more about Pip 
at campstreetcafe.com. You can find out more about me and this show at andyhedges.com. If you're enjoying this show and would like to help me keep it going, you can leave a donation on the website. Or you could rate the show and write a review on the iTunes store. Or you could simply tell a friend to give the show a listen. If you'd like to contact me with a question or a comment or tell me a story, I'd love to hear from you. Send an email to andy at andyhedges.com. Thank you for listening to Cowboy Crossroads. <laughs>